Ezekiel chapter 37. We're actually in the book of Acts. This is number 15 in the series. Uh, we'll probably have 150 going through the 28 chapters of the book of Acts. I don't know. No, uh, there are some, some things, for example, like the salvation of, of Saul. We can cover three chapters in the book of Acts under one heading. So we'll, we'll be able to streamline the study some for, for that. But it's an, it's an important book because in the first part of the book, we find the kingdom church being gathered back to Jerusalem being called there. That's what the day of Pentecost was all about. That's what the apostles were doing because they had promised if Israel would repent, the kingdom would come. But they only had a year. Uh, talk about a, a, a time period when, when, you, uh, when you set the clock and you have a countdown. They had one year to do it. And one year to the day, Stephen said, you were uh, 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 guilty of manslaughter because of your ignorance. But now you're no longer ignorant. You really know what you did and you still won't uh, repent. You're now guilty of murder. So that takes us through Acts chapter 7, which took place, mo most of which, on one day, the day of Pentecost, and then in one year. Now, from that point on, we find the, the degeneration of things. Moving from Judea now to Samaria, from the ministry of the 12 apostles to the ministry of the, of the seven deacons, but particularly two of them. In Acts chapter 7, who was it that died? Stephen. He was the chief of the seven kingdom church deacons at that time. Another one that was uh, called Philip the Evangelist, uh, was another very powerful man of God, uh, began uh, preaching. It wasn't Philip of the twelve, it was Philip of the seven. And so we see the focus being taken off of one region and one group of people and their leaders uh, given to another region and uh, leaders and so forth, group of people. Now, to explain Acts chapter 8, if you're reading through the book of Acts, you can understand uh, up to this particular point, and then you get to chapter 8 and you say, hmm, what could this possibly mean? And you'll, you'll never understand it. You'll, you'll ask yourself the question, what does this mean to me? And I would give you the answer. It means absolutely nothing to you with regard to your own personal application. You're not a Samaritan. You don't live in Samaria. You are not part of the nation of Israel. And unless you understand what happened in Israel's history, you'll not understand Acts chapter 8. Now, there is an application. And the application is this. We can understand that Israel's being cut off, and after Samaria is reached with the gospel, we have Acts chapter 9, and what event? Salvation of Paul, which starts what? The dispensation of grace. And so the kingdom program is being phased out, 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 until the great diaspora, and the grace program is being phased in, 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 with the ministry and writings of the apostle Paul. But again, that doesn't help us with regard to Acts chapter 8. Why did the Great Commission include not just Judea, but Samaria? Why did we have the first seven chapters of the book of Acts with Jerusalem and Judea in focus, and then all of a sudden in Acts chapter 8 we have Samaria? Well, one whole chapter given over to a ministry there except for the Ethiopian eunuch. Here's why. Israel used to be a united nation with 12 tribes, but uh, 10 tribes revolted. And we'll uh, go back uh, to some scriptures and read them, and it's quite lengthy. And it is difficult. You know, the, the average message on a Sunday morning, and especially now with regard to all the media means we have, and all the things that are happening in, in Christendom, the average uh, message is much shorter, <laughs> It contains many more stories, extra biblical stories, much more entertainment. Oh, well, I did this. Yes, and someone did this. Someone said that. And there's nothing wrong necessarily with that, except that's what fills much of the content and takes up much of the time. And it is. It's, it's much more stimulating. It's much more exciting. You can get into it. But then all of a sudden you say, we're now going to study the history of Israel. <gasps> you know? <laughs> You know, what are you fussing and fuming with your coach and when's this guy going to be over? And I understand that. But 
But I also understand that most people that sit under the, that type of ministry don't know anything about the Bible. And they'll come to Acts chapter 8 and they will spiritualize it. And they will they make, try to make it mean something uh, to them, try to get something out of it, you know, and, and all those uh, cliches that are in Christendom now. What is really happening? What's happening is, is that God is not going to give Israel any excuse and that God is going to hold all of Israel into account for not trusting in her, her Messiah. And, uh, and so we're going to have Israel reached in Judea, we're going to have the Samaritans reached, and we're going to have the diaspora reached. That was the ministry of the Apostle Paul. You know, Paul had a, a ministry not just of revelation, but of confirmation. He went into the areas of the, um, uh, of, uh, the Jews in, the, in, in Gentile territories that were dispersed. And he would go to the Jew first, and that is temporarily as, the, as his ministry went on. And what, what happened? He would confirm to them that what Peter said about the Messiah was true. They then would get mad at him. Who instigated much of the stoning of Paul, the persecution of Paul, the bad-mouthing of Paul? It was the Jews that he would go to and say, now look, Jesus is your Messiah. He would have a ministry of confirmation. Then they would reject him, and you know what he and Barnabas would do? They would go to the outskirts of the city and they'd stomp their feet. Why? That is a, an act or a symbol of judgment. Uh, I have nothing more to do with you. Hey, I don't care. You decided, you chose, that's fine. Off we go. And you know what he would say? Uh, you've, you've chosen this yourself. You're a witness against yourself that you don't want eternal life. Lo, I turn to the Gentiles. That is a ministry not only of confirmation, but of condemnation. The Abrahamic covenant says, Cursed is he that curses you. But there was one man who cursed Israel who got a blessing for it. You know who that was? Saul of Tarsus. It was Saul of Tarsus that said, Lo, I turn to the Gentiles. Blasphemy! Could he get away with it? Yeah. God was turning from Israel and bringing in the uh, Gentile dispensation known as grace. So who was it that cut Israel from not the fig tree, but from the olive tree. Three times in Acts, I turn to the Gentiles, turn to the Gentiles, turn to the Gentiles, and that's it. It was Paul who said those words. Uh, uh, Jesus Christ, God the Holy Spirit, cut the, the fig tree out, but who was it that cut them off of the olive tree? Romans chapter 11. The, the overall plan of God, it was Paul who was grafted in to the olive tree in their place. Gentiles were through the apostle of the Gentiles. Okay, but as yet, uh, the third ministry of Paul, by the way, was that of revelation, uh, that of giving the mystery. But that doesn't help us much with Acts chapter 8. We come there and read it, oh yeah, that's in the Bible, uh, and, uh, but it doesn't mean anything to me. Well, there was a reason for it. Do you know there are some parts of the Bible that will not mean anything to you except for your learning? It will broaden your understanding. It will help you to see what's going on in the overall picture. For example, there are some things that were pertaining to the Lord Jesus Christ and his cross work. Can you make those things apply to you? Would you like to be crucified this morning? Uh, and, and all the things that happened to you, you can't do it. Now, they, it happened to him. They were predicted of him, but they have no direct application to you except that he did it, and you believe it, and you accept that on, on your behalf, and you are saved through simple faith. So there are some things that you have to use hermeneutics for to understand, such is Acts 8. You come to Acts 8 and say, well, why in the world are they going to Samaria? So you go back to the history of Israel, they came up out of Egypt. Uh, the first generation was rejected. Second generation in, in, uh, with Joshua came into the land. Then they had their judges. Finally, you have the uh, covenant given to David, the Davidic covenant that his house would have the throne ruling over all Israel. But when David's son Solomon took over, we just read that, he was a naughty little boy. Uh, 
He didn't listen to God, and God, the Lord was angry with Solomon. All the wisdom God gave to Solomon, when it came to being around her, it never helped him out. Uh, he was influenced by the multitude of, of women that he surrounded. We're, we're not, you know, it's a... Uh, like uh, 600, I forget uh, now the, the exact number, but it's like 600 wives and 900 concubines uh, and, and so forth. Uh, but uh, he had a lot to deal with. And they all had their particular national gods, household gods. <laughs> God be merciful to Solomon, a sinner, uh, with, with all of that. But anyway, you know, you talk about quality time in a personal relationship. How in the world would you even know all their names? Oh, yes, uh, Solomon, this is uh, your wife, uh, so-and-so, uh, number 783. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, it got him in trouble. And uh, God said that he is going to divide the nation. And uh, we'll see these verses in just a little bit. He did divide it into ten tribes in the north and two tribes in the south under two men. Jeroboam took, it was a servant of Solomon, he took the ten tribes to the north. Rehoboam was the son of Solomon and he got two tribes to, to the south. And here's the important thing is with regard to their, their names. Uh, the ten tribes were called Israel and Samaria before the Assyrian captivity they were called that. Two southern tribes were Judah and the Jews, those that belonged to the tribe. But eventually, when the Samaritans came back, uh, we can go to the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and see where these two terms are used of all 12 tribes. They're used exclusively for groups. They're used collectively for the whole tribe. Now, we come to Acts chapter 8, and we have a whole lot of time being spent in Judea. And all of a sudden we move to Samaria. Why is this important? Well, in order for Jesus Christ to rule over 12 tribes, he must now unite the other 10, which were called Israel, to the two who remain faithful. Now, mind you, let's just stop here and give you a little more history. I know you don't like school. I know you, know you don't like history, but Bible history is important for us to understand these things. Uh, and that is, we talk about the Assyrian captivity. The Assyrian captivity involved the 10 northern tribes where the, the Assyrian king, uh, uh, Shalmaneser, uh, came down um, and uh, he surrounded it and uh, surrounded the city of Jerusalem and so forth and removed these tribes and took them back to Assyria. They finally came back. All right. The two southern tribes, was there a dispersion for them? Can anybody tell me uh, uh, yes or no? Excuse me. They didn't. Uh, uh, can anybody? Uh, we'll, we'll move down here to the two southern tribes. Can anybody tell me? Uh, who it was that um, took them from off the land? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went. Ezra went. Daniel went. What king was it that had the two southern tribes? It was Nebuchadnezzar, all right? And the two the southern tribes took them because finally they, they got in ultimate trouble to the pivot could not sustain them, the faithful pivot or, or remnant, and they too were taken off. Now, by the time you get to the great diaspora in 70 AD, you have the regions of Galilee, which uh, there were some Jews that settled there. Jesus was called a man of, of Galilee because uh, that's where his uh, hometown eventually ended up uh, uh, being Nazareth. Uh, then you have Samaria and you have Judea. And when the Romans came, they went from the south of the nation to the north of the nation, and there wasn't a Jew left. Uh, finally, uh, around about, uh, let's see, was it... Um, was it uh, 70, about 79, I forget uh, my, my dates here, but uh, that's what Masada was all about. There, were, there was a final contingent of Jews on the land, and they were up in Masada, the castle that uh, Herod the Great had built. 
And uh, the Romans, in order to, to take all the Jews off the land, finally built a rampway up there. But by the time they got there, what happened? The Jews at Masada were dead. All of them slit their carotid ar artery, just like they do the Passover lamb. They slit it. Uh, death is relatively uh, painless. You simply more or less fall asleep, lack of blood to the, the brain. You, you bleed to death. And out you go. And they did that. They did it to their children rather than being taken captive by the Romans and dispersed and humiliated. But the point is, with that event, how many Jews were left in the land of Israel? And the answer is zip, nada, zero, none. Okay, but now that still doesn't help us with Acts chapter 8. And that's what is happening here at this point in history. There are two factions or sections of Israel, and Jesus Christ is going to have to rule over all. Now, here are some prophecies predicting that. Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37. It says in verse number 15. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take you one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Now, did you get that? Did you get the two names applied to the two divisions? You're going to get one stick because Israel at this point is divided into two. Israel as the ten tribes and Judah as the two southern tribes. Why the one stick? Well, let's read on. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. Remember, there was a... a something about the, the, the tribes with Joseph and his sons. And here it is. Join them to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, What uh, wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these things? Say unto them, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is Ephraim, the tribes of Israel, his fellows. I will put them with him, even to the stick of Judah, and I will make them one st uh, stick, and they shall be one in my hand. And so th that's uh, what is going to happen. Uh, verse number 22, I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. Last part of verse 22, they shall be no more two nations they shall be, uh, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. So that is, that is what is happening here. With the Great Commission, before you go into all the world and preach the gospel, you're going to have to go to your own people first. All of the covenants that God made were made with Israel. And uh, this particular um, uh, the promise here is made with Israel in joining these two groups together. Okay, turn to Jeremiah chapter 31. Verse number 31. So there is a, a prophecy that God is going to take Israel and Judah, two separate kingdoms, and make them one kingdom on the land. This is part of the Great Commission, and why Jesus Christ said, you're going to be witnesses in Judea and Samaria. Israel and Judah, in other words. Uh, the two synonymous names for these regions representing these tribes, ten and two. And to understand what's happening in Acts chapter 8, you have to understand this. Okay, now verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant. Now, by the way, did God fulfill this promise of making a new covenant with Israel? It hasn't been totally ratified with the people yet and won't be till the kingdom. But did he take care of all the particulars of the new covenant for Israel? The answer is yes. 
Jesus Christ in the upper room said, what we're going to do here in just a little bit, <laughs> take this bread and take this cup. This cup is the what covenant? The new covenant in my what? In my blood. It's the blood of the new covenant. To whom was the new covenant made? Israel. To whom does it actually apply? Israel. Now, we get in on the blood of the new covenant in the, in the I'll use a 50 cent word here, in the salvific clauses, the, those that pertain to salvation. We get that. The same blood that's going to save Israel is the same blood that saves us. The rest of the new covenant pertains to them and does not pertain to us. Okay, so I will make a new covenant. Note the two names again. With the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Uh, the new covenant pertains to both these groups that he is going to make one according to the prophecies of Ezekiel. So Israel and, and uh, Judah represent these tribes, these regions, Samaria and, and Judah. Okay, and, and by the way, and we've, uh, we've had lots of uh, questions like with regard to the lost tribes. There, there, in actuality, there are no lost tribes. They are absorbed into the Gentiles, but God will call them home. The very fact that 144,000 are marked as pure-blooded, pure-bred Jews in the tribulation period, certified by God as to pedigree and genealogy, indicates that there are no lost tribes. They will be gathered back. God knows who they are and where they are. will gather them, and, uh, and there will be Jews in the tribulation uh, period, and that... Um, the 12 tribes, according to Ezekiel, will have a special parcel of land in the kingdom assigned just to them and uh, for them. Okay, now let's go back to 1 Kings. We're not going to have much time to peruse these verses, but... Okay. And chapter 11. Okay, verse number 30. Now, when we get back tonight, we are going to investigate the rest of these verses, and I know of no other way to do it to give you the background but to read them and comment as we go. Ahijah, who was um, a prophet of God, caught the new garment. Now, just by the way, God, God spoke to Jeroboam. At first, Jeroboam was not a bad guy. Jeroboam was going to be the instrument of God to wrench the kingdom away from Solomon for his misbehavior. God was in this at first. It was Jeroboam who turned it to idolatry and caused uh, his people to get uh, uh, the Assyrian captivity. Note, Ahijah caught the new garment that was on him. Can you imagine? He just came out of the store. Brand new tunic. He was wearing it with pride. New garment that was on him. And this prophet took and rent it in 12 pieces. I know if I did that today, I'd be in for the fight of my life <laughs> at the door of the church. Oh, hey, is that, a new, is that a new coat? 12 pieces. All right. Well, and he said to Jeroboam, take 10 pieces. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I'm going to rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon, and I'm going to give 10 tribes to you. Remember, this is... This is because I'm, I'm mad at Solomon, and uh, though I've made all of these promises to David, I'm going to temporarily punish the house of David for their idolatry. How is he going to do that? Well, hey, I'm going to lessen the number of people and, and um, national boundaries to just Judah and Benjamin and two tribes. I mean, that would hurt. Suppose you'd uh, uh, take away uh, 48 states uh, from... Uh, President Clinton for his misbehavior. Uh, wouldn't that hurt him? Yes, he would be crushed. All right, we'll leave it there. He, but, verse number 32, he shall have one tribe for my servant David's sake, for Jerusalem's sake, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, because they have forsaken me. Now note and worship Ashtaroth, 
uh, Chemosh, the, the Moabites, Milcom, which was um, uh, Molech, the god of the children of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways, and did as David, uh, his father. So what's he going to do? What is the punishment here with regard uh, to, to Solomon? He told Solomon, I'm not going to take the kingdom while you're still alive, but I am going to take the kingdom from you. And it's, he took it from his uh, firstborn son, Rehoboam. Let's read on and then we'll have to quit. I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him prince all the days of his life for David my servant's sake. But I will take, verse 35, the kingdom out of his son's hand and give it to thee, even ten tribes. And unto his son will I give one tribe. Now please remember that that was um, a, a word that was used for two tribes, actually, Judah and Benjamin. They were faithful, they united, and the like. Oh, okay, by, by the way, these two tribes here... Um, they came together at another place. For those that were at the uh, uh, evangelism conference in Canton, Ohio, what other place did two tribes come together, but um, of these two tribes come together, but they were split apart on something? Jesus Christ was of the tribe of Judah, lion of the tribe of Judah. Saul of Tarsus was of the tribe of Benjamin. In the Shekinah glory cloud on the road to Damascus, Jesus Christ of the tribe of Judah appeared to Saul of Tarsus and the tribe uh, of the tribe of Benjamin, and he made Saul of Tarsus the first member of the body of Christ, which is neither Jew nor Gentile. Jesus Christ stood there in all of his Jewishness, and he told the Apostle Paul, your Jewishness no longer matters. I'm going to make you the apostle to the Gentiles. And he split up the two tribes right here. That's, that happened on the road to Damascus. That's the historic significance of it. And you should be glad because you're a member of the body of, of, of Christ where neither Jew nor Gentile matters anymore. Okay? Uh, perhaps a verse or two and uh, we'll be done here. Uh, verse 37. I will take thee, and you'll reign according to all that thy soul desires, and you'll be king over, note the name, Israel. Where? He's going to be over Israel in Samaria. That was the region. Um, and it shall be, if you will hearken to all that I command me, and walk in my ways, and do what's right, as David did, that I'll be with you and build you a sure house, as I built for David, and will give Israel to you, the ten northern tribes. And I will not uh, for this afflict the seed, uh, and I will for this afflict the seed of David, but note this, not forever. Verse um, 40, Solomon sought therefore to kill Jeroboam. We're going to, to stop right there and we'll get into chapter 12 now. Upshot is this as we close this portion of our service. This is why the 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 message went, wasn't taken by the 12, but it was taken by Jesus Christ before the cross when he saw the Samaritan woman at the well of Sychar. They're of his family, they're of his tribes. So she said, our father Jacob. And then afterwards is why we have a movement into the realm of Samaria. In order for Jesus Christ as king to rule over the whole house of Israel, God to, to take the two sticks and make them one, He's got to reach these 10 tribes, and that's what they were doing.